Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. You know what I'm going to ask if you've done these before, please use the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. So I know we had people registered from all over the place, which I love. And once we, have, we sort of reach a little uh, quorum here, I guess we'll get started. Woodenville, hello, Deborah. Oh, hi. And Edmonds. Hi, Dale. Hi, Paulina. All right. We'll let a few more people get logged in here. And I'm sorry my camera's doing that autofocus thing again. Hopefully it doesn't look too bad for you. St. Paul, Minnesota. Hi, Jane. Tina in Seattle. Stephanie in Tacoma. Hello, hello. Oh, in Scotland. Hello, Connor. Welcome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I'm Lara Hamilton. I have a cookbook shop here in Seattle called Book Larder. And we are doing a few in-person uh, author talks and cooking classes right now, but we are continuing also to offer author talks on Zoom. And um, I think we'll keep doing them because they give us the opportunity to have conversations like the one that we will have today, where our author and our interviewer are, are in London and I'm here in Seattle and everyone else is tuning in from everywhere. So thank you so much for joining us. We are, of course, here today to welcome Zuza Zak, late, uh, author most recently of the wonderful book about the Baltic states called Amber and Rye. We actually have signed copies. Zuza sent us book plates here, I'll show you. So when you order from us, you will get her signed book plate there. Um, Zuza is going to be in conversation today with Alisa Tomishkina. She is um, a food writer, of course, and more recently an activist. Um, the spearhead, I guess, uh, instigator of the Cook for Ukraine effort that Zuza has also been involved in, um, and that I know that many of you have contributed to as well, um, raising awareness around culture in Ukraine and, of course, raising money from, for UNICEF. And um, they have raised over a half a million pounds at this point. So, um, you know, thank you everyone that's contributed to that and congratulations, Elisa and Zuza for doing such wonderful work. Um, I think Ukraine will probably come up a little bit in the conversation today. And um, I know they're both open to answering questions about that if you have those. But of course, um, we're gonna celebrate the food and culture of the Baltic states today. We are recording the, the talk it will be available on Book Larder's YouTube channel afterwards, uh, within about 24 hours probably. And so you can watch it again, or if you have to drop off early, you won't miss anything. Um, and you can also share it with other people if you'd like. We will leave time for questions today. If you could please use the chat to talk to each other and then use the Q&A button if you have questions for Zuza and Elisa, that um, will allow us to just sort of keep those questions a little bit more organized. All right, I am going to now turn things over to Zuza Zak and Elisa Timoshkina. Hello. Lara, thank you so much for inviting us. Thank um, you. It's, it's a real pleasure. I'm a big fan of <laughs> Book Larder. Um, so it's a real honor to host this lovely event. Also because Zuzu Zak is a dear friend and I'm a big fan of her work. And I think we share a lot in common. So um, I'm sure it's going to be a really lovely conversation between friends <laughs> and food writers. Um, so as Lara said, yes, this chat was um, planned a while ago and of course our lives have changed quite a lot and it feels like we are holding this conversation in a different world than from you know what we've anticipated and um, I think we also want to kind of have a natural flow to this um, chat and, um, but also wanted to structure it in a way that kind of touches upon really important topics like unity and togetherness through food, but also um, authenticity of identity and kind of how do we negotiate our own sense of self in 
the part, this part of the world, Eastern Europe. Um, so Zuza, um, my first um, talking point is about your childhood, because I think we can discover so much about ourselves um, when we look back into our childhood and of course the food of our childhood. Um, so you were born in Poland and during the socialist era. So could you tell us a bit about your sense of self and your family and the wider Polish community when you were growing up? Absolutely. And um, first of all, just thank you so much for being here, Alyssa, because I, you know, you have spearheaded the whole Cook for Ukraine uh, movement. And I am so grateful for that and to have the opportunity to actually be able to do something for Ukraine. Um, and you've really brought the whole food community together. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking time out because I know you've been just overloaded um, with this sort of, you know, the world on your shoulders at the moment and organizing it all. And it hasn't been easy, but thank you so much um, for doing that and for being here to interview me as well. Um, so my childhood in Poland, yes, it was um, during communist times. And um, I remember, lovely um, familial atmosphere and a wonderful community which really helped us to survive in those days. Um, as a child I guess you um, look at everything in a way um, from your sort of your own perspective and how comfortable you feel and and you really sort of um, just love everyone around you so my whole extended family felt so close to me it was so you know, I really, when I left Poland, I was thinking of all of them so much. And I was thinking, oh, what am I going to buy for my auntie? And what am I going to buy for my, you know, <laughs> because I knew that there was no money in Poland, but I could, like, when I go to the West, I'll be able to buy things for, like, my whole massive family. So I guess that's kind of how I thought of it. Um, and, and we all met um, around kind of um, the feast days. So I guess um, certain celebrations. Um, well, you know, those celebrations I think happened every week because we were meeting all the time and it felt like there was always someone's name day or someone's birthday and name days were really big in those days. I don't know if it was the same in Russia or... No, uh, I know it's, it's a Polish thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah is it a Catholic Polish thing? Catholic, yeah. yeah, so everyone essentially had kind of like two sort of days and we'd all congregate at my um, at my grandma's house in this kind of um, Soviet style block, you know, this communist block on the ninth floor and the lifts were often broken and we'd trudge up and my poor grandma was really overweight and should be like trudging up to the ninth floor on a regular basis. Um, and, and she was a fantastic cook. She was actually a cook by profession. So, um, she would with my aunties and we'd all kind of get together when we sort of be preparing so I guess the preparation was a big part of the feast as well and of that getting together and just sort of celebrating the little things and kind of celebrating one another so um you know there was always plenty of food on the table always uh, always normal um, wheat bread and rye bread, and I always go for the rye bread, um, always plenty of herrings, always the, you know, the vegetable salad, which we, we didn't call salad Olivier, we had all these different names for it, but we know the one, <laughs> the Slavic salad and all kinds of other mayo salads. There was always, you know, some little bit of invention as well. Um, there was always things like, uh, you know, cured pork fat, swaninka, things like that. Um, but actually, even if you just popped into my grandma's, I remember on a regular, you know, you'd pop into her, hers for a cup of tea and she'd be like, would you like some steak tartare, you know, or like, <laughs> would you like some buns or so there was always something there. So it always felt like a little mini celebration. Um, but of course, apart from that, um, in the wider world, um, it felt very, very heavy. Um, the atmosphere, the kind of, um, I very much remember and especially recently now because I think for all of us a lot of um, old wounds have been reopened recently um, as we kind of um, witness what's happening in the Ukraine um, and I do rem a lot of what's coming back is sort of a, a paranoia which I think has stayed with me until until this day I think it's it's one of those things that you know you work through as you work on yourself but 
um, the state of paranoia, I think, is um, something that um, a lot of pe people um, are being brought up in those kind of um, um, in those times remember um, because it was a case of um, not really being able to talk openly about things. Um, my parents were very, very um, strict on the fact that it mustn't repeat anything that was that has been said in the home to anyone, even if they seem like they're a friend. That you know you really can't trust anyone because they literally could come and take your parents away. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's something that's uh, that was the dark side. That was the dark side of those days, which which has really come back now because um, you know it was so long ago um, that I guess I have been looking at it kind of through rose tinted glasses a little bit. But what has happened in the last month or so for me has really brought back a lot of trauma. So um, I guess now I am exploring that shadow side of 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 what it means to kind of live in a place that isn't democratic and isn't free. Completely resonate with that and exactly the same experience is coming up for me right now. I, through my work, I kind of tried to make peace with the Soviet past. And I mean, I was never pro-Soviet past, but I was trying to find an angle into kind of a healthy acceptance of that shared experience. But as you rightly say right now, when I mean, in Russia, it's back already. Um, you know, suddenly that kind of animal fear is coming up and you actually realize that God, like, no, there's absolutely nothing positive about that. And, you know, it's terrifying just the thought of coming back into it. And I know that you uh, have left Poland when you were quite young and you came with your parents to live in the UK. Was that partly because of the political context? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So my parents were uh, never pro the system um, and just because you couldn't really um, get ahead any in any way or um, unless you signed the papers. It was always all about like, are you going to crack and sign those papers so you can do anything and you have some, you know, um, um, I believe they they held off, but you know they have friends who they're like, well, I think they did sign the papers, but you know at this point it doesn't really matter. People did what they needed to do to survive, you know. But it's being that kind of thing, being in that atmosphere where sort of a gun is felt, sort of held to your head almost, and like if you want anything good in your life, you sign this, mm -hmm. and you say that you're communist. You know, it's that that kind of brainwashing, that kind of you know single mindedness and the and the force. Um, so. I don't think anyone, well, I guess some people do support that, but uh, no one I know would want their child to live under that kind of pressure. So that was a big part of it. And they thought um, they came, we were just coming for a year. Um, actually, no, I think they told me that we were coming just for a year so that I wouldn't say anything to anyone, <laughs> but they knew because my mum said she wouldn't get pregnant unless they left the country. She refused to have another child. She said, and until they were in a different situation mm -hmm. and she left the country while she was pregnant. So they knew that they weren't coming back. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and, uh, and that was definitely uh, the political system that was, yeah. And how was your experience of coming to the UK? I always find interesting this kind of contrast of, you know, very broadly speaking, kind of the free Western world, you know, people do enjoy a lot of, a lot of freedoms, but at the same time, there's a lot of solitude and there's not enough sense of community and family, whereas in the kind of socialist block, whereas the outside reality is very bleak, but there's a very warm sense of family and the togetherness of, you know, that generally speaking, larger families would even potentially live together. So you have that kind of mm -hmm. contrast of the two values that kind of <laughs> don't ever meet. Um, how did you experience that transition from having, a, you know, the beautiful family gatherings that you've depicted to them being in a different country different food um not having your extended family and i mean you know it's giving me kind of goosebumps just thinking that's exactly what the ukrainian families are going through right now <clears throat> absolutely um gosh yes i've been thinking about that a lot as well i mean like as you say everything's just come back um it was it was really difficult actually <clears throat> because i didn't know the language and i was um seven years old seven and a half 
um, and um, I had all kinds of experiences, but as you say, it's different here. Um, you know, we were, we, I would call my cousins in Poland brothers and sisters. That's how, that was the language. So they were all my brothers and sisters. And here um, they're called cousins, you see. So that shows the kind of separation, like a cousin in Poland is someone just really quite distant. <laughs> like, you know, not someone that you sort of are, you know, very connected to as we were in those days and I guess it's changing a little bit in Poland now as well I mean my parents have built a house in a village where all my mum's family is so um, there is still that aspect where people just are popping into each other's houses all the time and that closeness and um, and I think they plan to go back for their um, you know retirement years for that very kind of atmosphere there is still an element of that in Poland but it used to be so much more and here it was very very lonely for a um, for a young child and of course in those days there weren't many Polish people in um, in the UK I mean there was a sorry can we just clar clarify the year when when that was happening just to contextual yes, uh, sure this was 87 so uh, the Polonia the the Polish diaspora that was here were the ones mainly that came after the Second World War. Uh, there was no kind of uh, Polish really immigration at that at that time, so it felt it, it did feel very very lonely. And um, now I look back on it and I completely see why my parents did it. But I think there was uh, there was a moment where I just sort of wanted to go back, and of course we didn't go back for seven years because what was really important for my parents was the British passport. And at that point, I'm sure food must have played a big part in giving you that sense of home. Um, you know, these days, at least in London, there's so many Polish shops that, of course, here you are not, um, you know, lacking any ingredients to bring that authentic taste of home but what was it like in the late 80s and how did you manage to create the taste of home polish shops are a very good point actually because <laughs> now they're everywhere and um you know um at, at school of Slavonic and east european studies where i'm sort of working on my phd i'm often kind of reading various kind of works and um and some academics even uh, compare the Polish uh, shops to the new church because it's such a place of kind of community. I love that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so food is the new church. <laughs> and, um, and it's very important, actually. And uh, I think for all migrants, actually, the more I read about it, the more um, there's been a lot of research done about that. And the, and the importance is really kind of highlighted these days. Uh, because um, I guess, yes, it's a, it's a sense of, uh, it's just that taste of home. And if it's not authentic, which it wasn't when I was younger because Polish shops didn't really exist or if they did, they were not very easily accessible and they weren't like they are now because there wasn't so much um, need for them. Uh, so the market wasn't there. Um, so we recreated certain Polish meals but they never tasted quite like they did in Poland. So when we did go back, finally, after those seven years, tasting the food was just, <laughs> it was just an ecstatic moment because, you know, I could have like kissed the ground, you know, like, <laughs> I know it's, it's silly maybe, but you know, you become such a patriot when you're separated from the thing that you know and love. Yeah, it's the distance that makes the heart <laughs> grow fonder, <laughs> isn't it? And how did you um, kind of, you know, when you became an adult, obviously having spent most of your, you know, what they call formative years or even more so, you know, most of your life in the UK, how did you feel about your kind of sense of self and your identity? Would you consider yourself as belonging to Poland or to the UK? Um, I would say both I think it's kind of national identity versus ethnic identity my national identity uh, I feel British you know I have a British passport I have a Polish passport as well to be fair um, however um, I, I'm not in, you know so fully involved in the politics of Poland obviously when something outrageous happens or something like that I get a little bit more involved but I'm um, 
I'm more kind of up to date about what's happening here because I feel like this is where I'm living. This is where this is my national identity. I'm, I'm a Londoner, I guess, you know, maybe people in Britain will look at me and say, well, she's not British, but you know, I think as Londoners, we definitely have our own kind of uh, Londoner identity as well, don't we? Um, and then my ethnic identity is, is Polish, but it's also um, Slavic as well. And um, so that's why I guess we feel so connected to, to everyone in the, in, in the whole kind of, in the whole of Eastern Europe, because uh, that's kind of, I know we don't talk about Slavic identity much, but this is what I feel like kind of genetically I am. Um, although perhaps a little bit Baltic as well, actually, which I found out during uh, my <laughs> Amber and Rye research. That was my next question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a fascinating topic and it's something that you and I have spoken about, that kind of phenomenon of Slavic identity. And though technically, you know, it's obviously a very loose term, but yet we do have a sense of some kind of affinity to the, you know, neighboring countries through food and, you know, religion and many other things. But of course, yes, in your case, it's fascinating that, you know, you've had that kind of potentially kind of dual sense of self, you know, British versus Polish, but then you had a big surprise recently where this whole new um, part of Eastern Europe was open to you and that's what became the inspiration for Amber and Rye so do tell us more about that. <laughs> yes that was quite interesting because you know it took me a long time to work out uh, my next cookbook um, after Polska it didn't come so quickly and um, it was still East European food was still a very niche subject I think now it's getting less niche and um, we're hearing more about it, but um, it was very difficult to come up with an idea that I could sort of sell to publishers essentially. Um, and I was researching various um, parts of Eastern Europe. I knew I definitely wanted to stay in Eastern Europe. Um, and I kept coming back to Lithuania because this is what um, my grandma talked about so much. That's where her uh, childhood and her youth were before she got um, expatriated to a part of Poland after World War II because she essentially felt Polish. And she always said she was Polish. And, and when I sort of as a child asked her where, but where in Poland? And she's like, no, no, we come from here. Well, I couldn't kind of quite add the two up. So then I was sort of thinking, well, why did they move you? It, you know, this is politics, isn't it? Why on earth would you just move people? Um, it turned out um, that um, her DNA, um, basically, I'll go back to, I was doing the research about the Baltic area and simultaneously, uh, my father was gifted a DNA test for Christmas. And um, in that one, uh, he found out he was half Balt, half Polish. That's what, half Baltic, half Polish. That's what the DNA test said. And so when I found that out, that kind of added to the whole kind of, um, interest in the in the Baltic states because um, I realized that things kind of clicked together and I did a little bit of research and it turned out that actually many people who are genetically Lithuanian felt they were Polish because of the historical ties, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Um, you know, Polish was sometimes the main language in Lithuania and um, things just kind of got mixed up like that and then I think at the time of the World War II everything got very nationalist so it was like you're Lithuanian you're Polish whereas it wasn't really like that before and there was no need for it to be like that and everyone sort of lived in peace together and things got very categorized and people were moved out of Lithuania so um, through her stories of Vilnius I always felt an affinity to that area so it was something then I realized that this had to, it had to be the Baltic States, that had to be the next book. That's such a fascinating story and it uh, really resonates with what I've just, I've just been listening to a really fascinating lecture from this amazing Russian historian uh, about kind of the history of nationalism and exactly just how futile and how pointless is this project of different states to displace people around but you know what you kind of the more questions you ask about someone's identity the more bizarre and absurd it becomes trying to pigeonhole them into a specific region because as you know sometimes people are wrongly placed in in the country they don't actually belong to but i wanted to um ask you 
uh, now more as a historian and someone who's doing a PhD and um, specializing in this part of the world. Could you tell us a little bit about the history of Poland and Lithuania? What are these kind of complex ties? And also, of course, um, whether that is reflected in food, I'm sure it is as well. <laughs> Um, absolutely. I think uh, Polish and Lithuanian cuisines are very, very similar. Um, you know, it's very difficult to say what is Polish cuisine exactly, because um, I think recently the Polish government had some kind of a project where they wanted to sort of place uh, 100 most Polish dishes. So that was their kind of like... <laughs> And of course, that is, you know, it's a Pandora's box because what belongs to Poland, what belongs somewhere else, you know, um, there was a huge Jewish population for over 800 years in Poland and Lithuania. Um, you know, there was the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, which really, um, gosh, that was the, really the golden time in the history of both those countries. Um, it wasn't. And when was that? It was in the Middle Ages. So it was in the in the Middle Ages. It was the most um, the most kind of cosmopolitan area in, in the whole of the world, really, because so many different um, ethnicities, nationalities, religions um, lived together um, in relative tolerance. I mean, in comparison to other countries, certainly there was um, relative peace and tolerance. Um, it basically all, oh gosh, it was, it was, it, there's been def de various different times in the, in the history of the Polish and Lithuanian Commonwealth. So, um, you know, it, and it sort of um, shrunk and it expanded. And I think it, in its most expanded state, it was not only Lithuania, but also uh, Latvia, um, Southern Estonia, and it went all the way down to Moldova and Ukraine, of course. Uh, so it was, um, it was huge. And, and through this kind of um, wide approach, uh, really it brought so much wealth and not only sort of wealth, but also, you know, uh, cultural wealth. So it, it, it was a time of growth and it was a time of um, great expansion. But actually, Polish um, Lithuanian history goes back even further than that, because in the 12th century, there was uh, Jadwiga and Jagiello, uh, the Polish Hungarian queen, and Jagiello, the um, a Lithuanian uh, prince who um, actually became Christian for, in order for the union to take place. So that was just before the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. It was only, I think, their grandchildren that started the um, the Commonwealth. But um, but that was already a time of growth. Uh, you know, they set up universities, and apparently they didn't like each other very much. But that's <laughs> by and by in those days. <laughs> And they ate completely different things. Apparently they had completely different tastes. <laughs> oh, that's not a very good union then. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they ate separately. They ate separately for their whole lives because they, their tastes were so different. And yet through that union, um, it really paved the way for the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth where, you know, it was a, a time of acceptance, I would say. And then when that acceptance stopped, I don't know if you've ever watched the famous Polish film with fire and sword. <laughs> Have you? It was huge in Russia, yes. <laughs> oh my God, it was a massive hit in Russia. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> well, there you go. That sort of shows you how the Commonwealth um, fell apart, essentially, because there was one king who was um, too strict too uncompromising and he um he essentially um it tore it just tore the, the the union apart i'm sure you remember the ukrainians in it and they were pro the king but they had certain problems with the whole system that could have been solved but the king instead took a very um uncompromising approach and it essentially destroyed everything what could have been a very um 
you know, fortuitous time. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds all too close to <laughs> what's exactly. happening now. Yeah. And um, so I was just thinking that you had this very interesting um, relationship to Poland because of having lived outside of Poland and you've developed that kind of beautiful um, nostalgic sense for it. But of course now the Baltic states and especially um, Lithuania is also playing that same part for you. And I remember elsewhere in your interviews, you've said you've depicted really beautifully how, you know, you kind of lived through your grandmother's stories uh, of the place. And you also felt very close to Vilnius in particular, because you almost had this kind of genetic memory of it. Um, what was your experience like actually going there for the first time? Yes, it was incredible. I mean, I thought I would find it interesting and I thought oh I'll like it you know of course I'll like it because you know it'll be interesting seeing it through my grandma's eyes in a way um but I completely fell in love with it it was and it was a very kind of physical thing almost because um when we got there it was a very hot day and uh, we, we had to give the hire car back back but I um I saw that there was the river that my grandma talked about just seven kilometers from Vilnius. And I was like, oh, we have to go there <laughs> before we give the hire car back. So we rushed to this river and had a swim in this river. And that was sort of, so before even going into the city, I was in the river and a very strong current actually. So like knew she couldn't go in too far <laughs> because it just sort of drags you away. You can sort of swim against the current and get a very good exercise. Um, but being in this water, I felt like these are my like ancestral waters. You know, my grandma was standing here. I wonder when she swam in here because I remember her stories of coming to this river. And I didn't realize there were two rivers. You see, there's Vilenka, which is the one that runs through Vilnius, which everyone feels um, very fond of. Um, but that's not the one you swim in. Actually, the one you swim in, uh, you go on hot days um, and you go just outside of the town. Um, and then we gave the hire car back and for the next few days we just spent walking around Vilnius and uh, all its little pockets and it's a it's it's an amazing city because it's you see moments where you're like oh this is as beautiful as Rome in this in this moment you know you can see the history and you can feel it and it's a, this baroque architecture and it's it's beautiful and kind of um grand and then you'll sort of turn a corner and there'll be a, a duck pond and uh, like you know, a little duck pond and a little river and some little kind of wooden houses. And it feels very villagey as well. And it's got both of both of those worlds, which is really lovely and it's quite unique. That sounds really beautiful. And I remember um, again, else, elsewhere, you were talking about uh, the title of your book, and of course, it's such a beautiful poetic title, and I believe it also has something to do with water, this legend about some mythical princess that came out of water. Oh, yes, the, um, there's a, um, I was just looking into all the kind of myths surrounding um, Amber, because uh, I mean, it's in so much mythology and it's um, because it was one of the pillars of the Roman Empire, you have sort of a, it was included in Roman and Greek mythology, but there was also a Lithuanian story of um, the goddess um, in the sea who had um, a beautiful amber palace. And um, I think Urarta she's called. Um, and there was a fisherman who was overfishing in the sea. So she went up to tell him off <laughs> for overfishing, you know, um, also very close to the times <laughs> and uh, being too greedy. Um, but because he was so beautiful, she fell in love with him and, and he fell in love with her and she took him down to her amber palace. But when uh, the main god, found out about this uh, he was very angry because obviously um, ordinary people were not allowed to live in the domain of the gods so he um, so he killed he killed her uh, lover and destroyed the whole amber palace and the amber that we find on the beach or we used to anyway as I was a child there was lots of it now and again we still find it 
um, is the, rema the remains of that palace. That's, that's such a beautiful story <laughs> and quite sad. So if Amber in the book title refers more to kind of the cultural context or the cultural symbolism of the book, obviously rye is food um, and taste of rye of, to me is taste of home. And of course it's huge in um, Ukrainian cuisine and Polish and of course in the Baltic states. So I wanted to talk now more closely about the food that you've experienced and you've eaten. And um, is there a way to describe Baltic cuisine as a whole, or would we still need to talk about all the three different countries and their cuisine? Um, I think it's both um, local and regional, and we can talk about it as a Baltic food movement, because I think there's a renaissance in all the Baltic states, and they do have certain ingredients in common. Rye is one of them, of course, and rye is an important one because it's such a hardy crop and it's really sustained that northern East European part of the world um, at times when they would have had difficulty really um, surviving otherwise. So that's why rye is such a kind of important one. But there's also barley, there's millet, um, wheat not so much. Uh, but um, obviously buckwheat is a big one for us. We all, <laughs> we all love that. And the way it's being used now is a bit different to how it was in the past. For example, um, I found in the Baltic states often kind of Ottolenghi style buckwheat salads. So using that grain, but then using lots of other kind of East European ingredients or local ingredients. For example, you know, pickles, mushrooms, fermented things, beetroots, and putting together these kind of rich salads that complement uh, complement that buckwheat, toasted buckwheat flavor. Um, and then there's, of course, the curd cheese that we eat in all those countries. There's um, herb, dill, obviously is a big one. <laughs> but then you have like maybe more specific herbs. For example, um, when I was talking to a man who um, makes his own sausages that he sells, but he, him and his wife make them essentially in their farmhouse. It's their kind of hobby, um, but it's his grandma's recipe. And I couldn't recreate it because he uses special Estonian oregano. So it's very local. And yet he's proud enough of it that he wants to share it. He goes out and, you know, he, he's part of the, that food movement. Um, of course, the herrings are popular in all the Baltic countries. But then you go to somewhere like Latvia and you have the Latvian hemp butter, which the book actually starts with. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's quite addictive, isn't it? And actually, I think it's got some CBD in there. So I think it makes there's some kind of element of a feel good kind of thing to it. So it's just essentially um, unhulled hemp seeds, uh, toasted and then crushed to a to a kind of crunchy paste almost like a it's like a peanut butter but it's not a peanut butter it's sort of black and crunchy and delicious um and you can have it in sweet and savory dishes so that's kind of a more um kind of local element and then again you'll have things like maybe with a more soviet feel like something like sirniki made from the curd cheese, which, you know, you would eat in all three Baltic countries, perhaps in slightly different ways. I mean, um, the one I have in the book involves um, popped chocolate buckwheat. And I thought that was a really interesting recipe that um, I, I was inspired to recreate that when I tried something similar in a, in a cafe in Parnu on the coast of Estonia. Um, but then you'd go somewhere else and you would maybe have Sirniki in savory form um, served with eggs, eggs Benedict or something. So then you have like a more kind of just modern European fusion and, and that's also part of the movement. That's really fascinating. And uh, the Baltics of course um, is has been subjected to quite a lot of trauma as well, historically speaking, you know, the Second World War, the way it's been divided like a chessboard and, you know, just completely appropriated by a foreign state. Um, 
what is the attitude or the memory of the Soviet regime like and how is that reflected in food because having I read your beautiful book. You know, there are a lot of dishes that are from the Soviet era. Um, not, not too many, but, you know, there still is a sense that that uh, cuisine and kind of the memory of that time is still present. Did you have a sense of the attitude towards that particular historical period from people? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question um, because I think food from the Soviet era is also a part of this food movement. And I think uh, it's been sort of reinvented in a way. So it's been um, taken on board and then used in a kind of new and refreshing way to express maybe um, their independence now. Um, in terms of the attitudes, I would say, I think the different, it's a generational thing. So different generations will have different attitudes. Um, and also, I guess you have different ethnicities because, you know, in Estonia, you'll have also the kind of ex-Soviet population, the older sort of um, people that came from Russia there. Um, it's, uh, it's all very mixed up, but I guess um, the new kind of, the new wave of Baltic energy is coming from, from the, the newer generations. And rather than kind of feeling sort of bogged down by it, I feel that it, the energy comes, it's a very positive, from a very positive place. And it's a place of kind of renewal and um, of using what they have, whether it came from Estonia, like Kama, for example, it's a very Estonian thing and that's being used everywhere. Or whether Another it, absolutely delicious thing that I loved from your book is like probably the <laughs> highlight for me for sure. Yeah, so that's the kama, which is a mixture of grains, including rye, barley, ground to a flour. It's got a very multi flavor to it and it's used in many desserts. So you, you might have that on the menu, but then you'll also have something like sirniki on the menu. So it, it will be a mixture of different things. And that's what was really wonderful about that energy because, you know, food doesn't have these kind of political boundaries. I feel like food is really the language of inclusivity rather than separation. I love that so much and it's so relevant right now and it's it's such a beautiful way I think to conclude our part of the discussion and we're going to open it I still have lots of questions so if people feel a bit intimidated you know as many do about asking questions I still have a few <laughs> but I'm gonna just check the Q&A box now and um try to make sense of it because <laughs> I've never done this before um <laughs> So Lacey is asking, I'm working on starting my own Czech dumpling food stall. Can you give me any advice on recipe development, uh, specifically how you make recipes your own when they've been made and passed down for generations by everyone's grandmother? That's a very, that's a very good question, actually, because, you know, I guess um, many arguments have been had <laughs> about <laughs> this kind of uh, topic, you know, what's appreciation, what's appropriation, what's, you know, <laughs> what's authentic and what's inauthentic. And I guess I take quite a modern approach um, because I want to preserve traditions, but I don't want to do it necessarily just like a food anthropologist where I'm just recording things. I also want to um, make things, I love that new energy as well. So I want to make things new and, um, and, and it's authentic in terms of what's actually happening now in those Baltic countries and in Poland, for example. So um, I guess if I was you, I would keep grandma's recipe on the menu and then I would do my own version. And just through experimenting and I don't know if the grandma is savory whether you'd want to do like a more sweet version or the other way around whether you want to um just for your own version experiment with uh, different seasonal ingredients depending on the time of year um and depending on what's happening in the world around you whether you want to reflect that and you can really go crazy with them um, with dumplings as I have been recently because that's what my next book's about <laughs> 
<laughs> I was just gonna say, yeah, you're, <laughs> I've had the pleasure of assisting on a shoot for the book, and like the recipes are just incredible and how inventive. So yeah, I completely agree that it's great to go crazy and inventive. Um, and Czech dumplings, I have to say, that sounds really interesting. I'd love to know more. So if Lacey feels like telling us a little bit about that, that sounds amazing. Um, the next question we have is from Tina, and she is asking, how is the cookbook organized and how did you select the recipes? That's a brilliant question. That was something that I, <laughs> I was going to ask as well yes. to talk um, us through the book or walk us through the book. <laughs> great. Yes, um, I think <clears throat> I'm really happy with the way it's organized, but I think it does confuse um, some people. And I will explain to you why, because um, I have done it, the Baltics as a whole. And then when I go into each recipe, I say where the recipe comes from, whether it's someone's precise recipe that I am kind of recording um, or whether it's my take on something or et cetera, et cetera. So the way I wanted to do it was breakfast. Um, and then we have um, soups. Let me just make sure I'm doing all the... So yes, we have beginnings, which is breakfast. And then we have starters and snacks, which is basically Zakuski. So it's like East European meze. Um, but the thing is, we have introduction to the beginning, then beginnings, and then we have a talent. So in between each kind of um, meal, I also have essays on various uh, cities that I visited. And, and then there's a long essay on the Amber Trail to end the book as well. Um, so then we have soups main event and within that there are um, uh, basically meals from every country but what I have noticed um, some journalists I think a couple now have sort of said to me all right so we are eating breakfast in Tallinn you know because they think that the breakfast chapter is just from Tallinn which which isn't it's not like that it's a little bit more uh, free form. <laughs> And I also just wanted to add from myself that uh, reading the book, you just get this really beautiful sense of travel because it's also a travel book. It's not just recipes. There's stories, obviously, of your own travel, but there's also journeys into history and into myth and folk tales. So it's a really beautiful, yeah, kind of all immersive experience, which yeah, I highly, highly recommend <laughs> to experience. And especially it was so timely at the time of the um, lockdowns when we couldn't travel. Having read Zuza's book, it just felt like I've just taken the most beautiful trip without having to leave my <laughs> sofa. And Tina also has a follow-up question about your favorite recipe. If you could choose one savory and one sweet one, if it's not too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite hard. <laughs> Um, that is quite hard because you know some are like maybe from my childhood others are more from the journey and and like you say Alyssa with lockdown with how much the world has changed it feels like another world that was the last time I traveled anywhere so for me it's got that extra kind of dimension of just oh travel you know <laughs> like and it was, it was such a beautiful long trip it was that kind of meandering trip not just kind of going on holiday quickly you know um so because there are so many memories it's a very it's a very difficult one to choose um I, I will mention just a couple from my head I won't start going through the book <laughs> but I'll just mention a, a few um one that jumps out at me and I've been cooking a lot recently um is the rye bread um, and chocolate mousse, which is based on the Estonian bread soup. <laughs> and it's kind of a different way of making chocolate mousse. I presented it recently to, um, to lots of people in the food industry because um, I just thought, you know, it's nice to make mousse without so much like, you know, butter and stuff like that. It's actually based on rye bread and that taste of rye bread really, really comes through. It's not exactly a fluffy mousse, but it, it's, um, it's a little bit more substantial than that, but my partner absolutely loves it. He says, you know, it feels like a healthy chocolate mousse. <laughs> um, so that's, I'll maybe choose that as my, to keep it simple, as my sweet one. Um, as savory, oh my gosh. Um, maybe, maybe one of the soups. I mean, I do love the soups. 
I'm going to have to choose a breakfast as well, though, because <laughs> that's not really sweet. It might be sweet, but it's not really sweet. <laughs> so I'll allow myself that luxury. Um, the sirniki with the popped chocolate buckwheat is really one of my favorite recipes. I, I actually made that on Polish TV a few weeks ago, and I chose that for the reason that I just feel like everyone should try it. So that's another one I recommend. Um, and then maybe for the savory one, I would go for the um, well, which is the cold um, beetroot soup, but it's done in a different way here because I'm using this fermented uh, beet kvass and kefir, um, which isn't the sort of Polish style chodnik I have in my first book, Polska. It's a, uh, once you've made the kvass, which takes a few days, it's so simple to put together. And, um, and I feel like that's just the taste of summer in, in those countries. Oh, I love, I love that soup. And can I just add from myself <laughs> that I love your plum butter and then uh, pancakes with prunes. Oh my goodness. Like since reading that in your book that I can't make those pancakes any other way. And I think, why haven't I thought of that? <laughs> That's like the best possible way of making pancakes. Um, we then have a question um, I'm just going to skip one to come back to it at the end, if that's okay. Um, and we have the lovely Caroline Eden with us. <laughs> I've spent the last two weeks uh, having the pleasure of speaking to Caroline, and it's so lovely to have you here with us. Um, so Caroline is asking a question about Poland rather than the Baltics, um, but she would love to know more about the hearty stew bigos, which is amazing. <laughs> uh, historically, I think she says, made in forest clearings where hunters would drop their game into a pot simmering with pickled fruit. I use bacon and Polish sausages here at home and also Turkish prunes. What other fruits and meat are used, Susa? Do you have a favorite version? Um, <clears throat> well, thanks, Caroline. And I just want to say that I really enjoy um, I haven't made it yet, but I, I really enjoyed reading about the Bigos in your book, um, Black Sea, because you also write about Mitzkevich and um, and it's uh, just a really lovely kind of uh, introduction uh, to this dish, the hunter's stew. So a typical Polish Bigos um, would be made over three days. And um, actually, Alyssa, I love your version that's made much quicker. I absolutely loved it. You know, when I went to your supper club, that just um, it was it was incredible and it kind of blew my mind. Um, but I guess in Poland, they will always say, oh, well, that's, you know, sauerkraut stew, but bigos needs to be made over three days. So <laughs> so that's, I guess, the one the one thing they say that um, haste and a distracted mind one. Um, I can't remember exactly who said that, but there was there's a quote, I think, in my book about from a food historian. Um, who says, you know, haste and a distracted mind are kind of the enemies of bigos. You need to have plenty of time <laughs> and you need to be focused. What I put in my bigos um, is usually, I, I put in lots and lots of different types of meat in it. And yeah, I try not to make it too meat heavy. So I, um, I'll often put in some venison, but I'll put that in kind of near the end. So I won't stew that for three days. I'll put kind of like the fattier kind of cuts, things like maybe a little bit of pork belly or something like that um, to be stewing for three days at the beginning. Um, I'll use things like Polish sausage, definitely, but again, fried on the side and then I um, put it in later. Um, and of course, mushrooms, plenty of plenty of dried mushrooms. I guess that's my, my bigos is very, very mushroom heavy. And then I'll use dried mushrooms, but I'll also fry fresh mushrooms all the different varieties I can get in butter and I'll add them in as well um, and then yeah of course always you need that sweetness in bigos so something like prunes um, and um, yes I mean some people um, like to make bigos over three days but then add some fresh cabbage in as well and not just the fermented cabbage I tend to use um, only fermented cabbage, but that's kind of a matter of taste as well. Um, and I like to use my own fermented cabbage. <laughs> that's my secret. And lots of wine. 
And I remember having a, <laughs> we had a bit of a disaster when you were cooking for my supper club and <laughs> the frozen beagles were stuck to the freezer. <laughs> but it was, we rescued all of that and it was great. But yes, <laughs> we had a fun beagles experience. Um, next, we have a question from Connor who is asking, uh, my kid Archer would like to ask if any of the recipes are from your own family. Yes, the, the prune butter, the plum butter that Alyssa mentioned is really what started the whole journey because uh, that was one of the tastes that I associate with my grandma Halimka's apartment and she had jars and jars of it under the cupboards and she would always ask me to go and get a jar of the plum butter and you know I'd lie down on the floor and get the the jar out and she'd always taste it first just to make sure it was okay and I mean gosh she must have had so many plums to make this plum butter because literally plum butter is the simplest thing to make but you need huge amounts of plums and ideally they'd be vengerki which we call like the Hungarian plums but they're, they're basically uh, dark and quite tart um, which I sometimes have difficulty finding something similar in in the UK so that's one of those things that's a, it's a bit strange because when it's plum season in Poland you get huge amounts of plums and in England you get sort of like maybe a few here and there and I just you know I can't get it in those kinds of quantities or it cost me like 100 pounds or something <laughs> to get really nice um, so that is kind of the main recipe that started it all and um yeah, there are a few kind of uh, recipes dotted throughout the book, but I would say that's the, the main one, the one that's really close to my heart. Thank you. Um, and then we have a question from Katerina who is saying, I really like using rye to make bread, but what other ways of using rye are we missing out? Oh, well, actually, that's very interesting because recently when I did my workshop, um, for the people in the food industry, industry, it was called Exploring Rye. Um, and I focused on the Baltics because what I really loved about the Baltics was the way they celebrate rye. This whole new Baltic food movement kind of um, it celebrates it. Um, so for example, the, the mousse I already mentioned, which is um, based on the Estonian bread soup, but also things like the Latvian rye bread um, trifle, which is um, toasted rye bread with cinnamon and brown sugar with berries and uh, cream. And it's, and it's basically layered like a trifle. That was one of the things. Um, kama, of course, which I mentioned already, which is used you know, in kefir or in ice cream and various things like that. Um, so yeah, I really focused on the sweet ways of using rye because I think it's underused in, in sweets. Amazing. Um, thank you so much. I believe we don't have time for any more, even though there are a few questions that were left unanswered, but I'm sure Zuza will be very happy to answer them on Instagram or, um, yeah. Um, shall I pass back to Lara before just saying thank you, Zuza, so much? Uh, we've been planning to meet up actually for about a few months and we haven't managed to do that. So it was so wonderful to do this together. Um, I've really enjoyed spending this hour with you. And uh, Laura, again, thank you so much for inviting me to interview my lovely friend. Yeah, no, thank you so much for doing it. And as you mentioned, you know, when you started, we planned this in a completely different time. And um, but I think it's it's so important to just stop and um, sort of talk about culture and food and celebrate. So thank you both of you for taking time, um, especially with Lisa. I know you have to you have to scoot. So um, thank you so much for doing this. There was a question that I wanted to make sure you got the chance to answer, which was how can people in the US support um, the Cook for Ukraine effort? And um, so if you wanted to give us a second of that, that would be really great. Um, yes, sure. Um, well, I think the shortest answer would be is to go to Just Giving page. If you type in Just Giving Cook for Ukraine, then that page has all the information about the campaign and about how to join. Um, but also just to stress that this is a global campaign and we do have partners in the US, so you can actively join from the United States and of course would be super grateful for any support. So thank you for that question. 
Yeah. And I think it is also one of those things like as you're cooking Ukrainian dishes, if you are, you know, someone who posts them on social media tag cook for Ukraine. It's also just that act of, I think, showing solidarity, right, and kind of keeping um, the culture and the people front of mind, I think is just so important right now. So Yeah, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. Zuza, congratulations on your absolutely wonderful book. I did want to say for our Pacific Northwesterners here, um, one of the things that really um, stood out to me was we have, besides a big Lithuanian community, we also have a huge Scandinavian community and how, you know, there's just, I, you know, you, you sort of catch little glimpses and really understand, you know, I can't remember which one of you said it, how these food doesn't really have these borders, you know, and so, um, so if you like Scandinavian food, you will absolutely love this book and you will see all kinds of new ways to use ingredients that it might already be familiar with so just wanted to throw that little plug in there too so <laughs> absolutely absolutely I, I really feel like baltic food is a mixture of kind of east european and scandinavian with its own kind of baltic spirit so i think yeah that's thank you so much for mentioning that actually yeah, yeah that's oh, definitely an aspect to it yeah thank you and Alyssa, thank you so much it's so wonderful spending this hour with you lots of love it was a great conversation. Lots of love to both of you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And again, Zuza, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you to everyone who came. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.